Welcome to the conference. This is AMI Inside. Good evening, CVTC. Welcome to the Canadian Vision Teachers Conference, Seeing Beyond the Horizon 2018. The CVTC is open to teachers of the visually impaired, orientation and mobility specialists, as well as school staff and other members of a child's learning team. The objective is to develop strategies, address challenges and solve problems to better support students in the classroom. This biennial conference, held this year at the NISCU in and Conference Centre in NISCU, Alberta, features keynote speakers from around the world. Dozens of concurrent sessions address a wide range of subject matter, from equity and advocacy to sport, education and technology. More than two dozen vendors are set up in Exhibitors Hall. Here attendees are able to check out the latest in assistive technology. A wide range of organizations related to the blind and low vision community are also represented. First, on AMI Inside... Hello, how are you guys doing this morning? Diagnosed with retinitis pigmentosa when she was four years old, Molly Burke didn't want to be known as the blind girl. So, she created her own vision of herself. Now at 24, she's a motivational speaker, YouTube celebrity and activist for the blind and the visually impaired. She's come to the Vision Teachers Conference to present Light Up Your Life, celebrating you, helping others and finding hope. Here with me, I also have my guide horse. His name is Gallop, Gallop like a horse running, but that's not the only reason I refer to him as my guide horse. Uh, when we got him, he actually weighed more than I did. Most of my audiences are very unfamiliar with blindness. I'm sure all of you have a much better understanding of, of blindness and what it's like on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, the, the spilling of things, the walking into of things, when I pet a stranger's leg instead of my dog, um, and so, so many other wonderful things like talking to a cardboard stand instead of my mom. <laughs> But today is not about sharing my awkward blind girl moments. Today really is not about me at all. I'm really just here to use my story, my journey, um, as a vehicle to help all of you realize the power and the potential that you have living within you. Molly led a pretty normal life, growing up in Oakville, Ontario with her dad Peter, older brother Brady, and mom Nev, who is with her today running the PowerPoint for her. She was active even playing competitive soccer. I was center forward every single year. I was voted most aggressive player. At 13, however, life was about to change. Through the Mira Foundation, Molly went off to Montreal for guide dog training with her first dog, Gypsy. It was here she began to notice something troubling and reluctantly called her mom at home in Oakville. I had this pit in my stomach. I knew I should tell her about my vision. I just didn't know how. So we're about to hang up and I say, there's one more thing, mom. I think my vision's getting worse. And on the other end of the phone, all, all I could hear was the sound of her breathing. It's okay though, don't worry, mom. I'm gonna be just fine. And at the time that I said that, I didn't realize how wrong I was. An October visit to her ophthalmologist confirmed her biggest fear. Blindness was no longer just this idea, something I talked about. It was really happening. Returning to school the next day, Molly told her friends about what the doctor had said. She didn't exactly get the response she'd expected. So when one of my best friends turned to me and said, well, at least you're not dying of cancer. And she was right. I wasn't. And don't get me wrong, I was thankful for that. But what she didn't seem to understand and what it felt like nobody was understanding is that it felt like a piece of me was dying. Things were just caving in, closing up around me, fading away, and there was nothing I could do to stop it. I went from being the popular girl walking down the hall surrounded by friends to walking down the hallway alone, hearing my old friends yell, watch out, blind girl, as I walked by. She was then questioned by a guidance counselor about the validity of her blindness. She knew I was faking it. I hadn't actually gone blind and told me that because I was faking it, I was bringing all of this negative attention to myself, the bullying. Discarded and bullied by her friends and mistrusted by teachers, Molly began to feel alienated and alone. 
and I didn't know what I was going to do. And life wasn't about to get any easier. Still adjusting to her vision loss, Molly ended up tripping, falling down some stairs and severely injuring her ankle, ending up on crutches. The private school Molly attended assigned a group of peers to assist her getting around, which turned out to be the same group that had been bullying her. That's when they started leading me outside, across a field, down a hill, across another field. And I can tell you I was working up a sweat using these crutches. I didn't know where we were going. It was getting harder and harder. There was roots on the ground. I heard birds chirping in the trees above me, and I realized that we were in a forest. I was tired, so I sat down and I put my crutches by my side and one of the girls came up to me. Hey Molly, can we see your crutches for a minute? And I just felt my chest tighten and this lump grow in my throat. And I felt that just in time to hear one of them grab my crutches and smash them against a tree, breaking them. Which was followed by the sound of their footsteps and their laughter fading away as they left me. And I realized I was alone in this forest. I couldn't see, I couldn't walk. They had my crutches, my backpack. What was I supposed to do? I was supposed to be in class soon. Was anyone gonna notice I wasn't there? Would they miss me? Would they come looking? Would they even care? And eventually, I realized I had my cell phone in my pocket. I grabbed it, frantically dialed my mom's number, and I was sobbing so much she could hardly understand what I was saying, but when she calmed me down enough to figure out where I was, she rushed off from work, came and got me, scooped me into her arms, and carried me to the car. And that was the last day I attended school. As a family, it was decided that Molly would finish grade eight from home. These were dark times for this young girl, and it was only later, at an event for the Foundation Fighting Blindness, that Molly finally found what she was looking for. Hope that I can overcome this. Hope that it won't always be so bad. Hope that I will move on to find success, love, happiness in my life. And it was that night that I started my journey of rediscovering what hope now meant to me. That journey led Molly to win the Miss Teen Canada International title in 2010, becoming the first young woman with a disability to do so. I realized that I'm not defined by my disability. I'm defined by the person my disability has helped me to become. It was this experience that propelled Molly forward. At just 18 years old, she connected with Craig Kilberger, founder of the Me to We and We organizations. And for the next two years, Molly toured the world as a motivational speaker, sharing the stage with people like Demi Lovato, Al Gore, and Mikhail Gorbachev. In 2017, Molly became the face of Dove's latest international ad campaign. And alongside her successful career as a motivational speaker, she releases weekly YouTube videos to a worldwide audience of over 210,000 people. And finally, we all have a measure of hope inside of us. And no matter how dark your situation might feel at times, you have the power to find that hope. My life, my experiences, my journey up until this point is proof of that. Thank you so much. AMI Inside spoke with Molly and her mom, Nev, following her keynote address. I really wanted to help the audience to understand um, the role that they can play in the life of their student or child who's blind um, and in, in empowering them to find hope, to reach their full potential, to never give up on the dreams that they have, um, to show them that, you know, really with the right support system, the journey is not going to be easy, but you're going to get there to a really good place. I would say my biggest mentor is my mom. She always has been and I think always will be. Uh, she's not only my mentor and my mom, but she's my best friend. She works with me in my business, and I just don't know what I would do without her. Nev Burke, Molly's mom. She's very easy to connect to, Molly. Like, she's a super easy person to connect to. I would say Molly innately is a much more confident person than I am. We asked what it was like when she heard the diagnosis. I think I blocked out that there could be any issue, real, you know, serious issues. So I was fine until we got the diagnosis when Molly was four and a half. And then it was shocking, to be honest, like very shocking. And it took five years of to recover. Molly's come a long way from those dark times, having recently moved to Los Angeles, where now the sky's the limit. I'm very much like, you know what, let's come out with a clothing line. Let's write a book. Let's do a movie. Like. 
let's date Justin Bieber, why not? Like, let's put anything out there that we want and go for it and try and why not, you know? Just see where life takes you. Coming up on AMI Inside. On screen braille, you can do in two different ways, flat or away. Apple Learning Specialist Tim Kilburn explains Apple's voiceover capabilities and tells us about a must-have app. The product channel allows you to scan barcodes on a box of cereal or something so you know what it is without having to stick your finger in and say, mm, Cheerios. Don't go away. AMI Inside will return. This is AMI Inside. Retail fold up. As long as you hear voiceover say what is on the screen, then you can double tap anywhere on that screen to open the item that voiceover has focus on. Tim Kilburn is a technology consultant for the Catholic School Board in Fort McMurray, Alberta. He's also an Apple specialist. He's come to the conference to present voiceover basics for Mac. On screen braille, you can do in two different ways, flat or away. Tim has been using assistive technology and Apple's accessibility products for a long time, as he was diagnosed with retinitis pigmentosa when he was very young. By the time I finished high school and started going off to university and stuff, my eyesight started getting at least noticeably worse for me, um, to the point that uh, when I was 19, I got a service dog. And it's been gradually worse now to the point where I mostly just have light perception. Apple has long made accessibility a part of their platform, so Tim has come to shed some light on the basics of Mac's voiceover technology. Your Apple TV has voiceover as well. Your, if you have an Apple TV, it can, it can talk. Your watch, your Apple Watch, has voiceover on it as well. Phone, iPad, Mac, all of them are accessible. Pretty well every single stock app that Apple puts onto your iPad or your iPhone is accessible. All the buttons are labeled, everything does what it's supposed to do from a voiceover perspective. Because voiceover has focus on the specific, on the specific icon that's on the screen, I just double click or double tap, I mean, anywhere on the screen. Maps, Friday, May 4th. Let's go. So camera's way up on the top row somewhere, I'm there. So I'm gonna double tap down near the bottom and it's gonna open up the camera. camera. Focus unlocked. Image. The gestures that you, need to, that you need to know the most are your Google flicking Maps. right or left yes. to go back and forth through Canada. these. Friday, May 4th. Your page turning, which was your three finger page three of three. left, page right, page those turn. kinds of things. There is also one that's very useful to you called a rotor. So you twist your fingers like you're turning up the volume or turning down the volume of a, of a radio. Now, most young people might not know what we're talking about because you just push a button for that, but you do need to use it like that. So if I twist the rotor, characters. when I twist the rotor and I'm now in characters, I can go E, A, T, H, E. So that's can weather. That was the one that I flicked. If I flick down through each one of those when I'm in character mode, it's going to go through word or letter by letter. I, its default is on actions. That's when. That's why when you double click it, you can or double tap it, it'll do things. Language. I can change the language here. What do I got languages on here? English, Australia. English, U, S. Vertical navigation. So vertical navigation. That's another thing within the rotor. So I can, when it's in vertical navigation, Dice world. Folder. if I flick no, down it. now, App store. it's going Page down adjustable. vertically through those. Headings. Headings is more useful when you're on a web page because then if I, I, can, I can just swipe Page down. Found. There's no headings on the front page here. Containers. Containers, Containers are blocks of objects when you're when you're visually looking at things like when i go into page two or three adjust settings 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 the left side and the right side are two different containers containers 
containers, I should be able to go. Tim J. Kilburn, Apple ID, general, heading, about, button. There. Tim J. Kilburn, Apple ID, about, button. General, heading, about, button. There, that's the last container is the group of things over there. General, heading. There's a heading for general. Tim J. Kilburn. I'm going Apple backwards because I'm flicking up. That means I'm going backwards through it. Settings, heading. There, and I can go through there. So those are your containers. What else do we got? Audio ducking. Audio ducking means that it will mute things. If I was playing music in the background at the same time, it would mute that music when voiceover, or not mute it, but quiet it down so that the voiceover could still be heard over top of things. Volume. And the volume, I can change the volume that way. I can use the regular buttons, but I can go. 75%, 70%, 65%, 60%. I can turn it down. 65%, 70%, 75%. I can turn it back up. Words. Then I'm back to words where I can go through this and I can go Airplane. mode. Word. So lot, basically on these screens, it's not, th those sort of actions aren't so exciting. Characters. But when you Characters. get into a, a document and you need to go letter by letter, those kinds of things are very helpful. I'm not gonna go a lot into Braille, but it is very well supported. You can use either a Braille display or, uh, or you can use on-screen Braille as well. The app that I'd like to focus on is the Seeing AI app. It's actually developed by Microsoft for the iPhone. Menu, button. Seeing AI has a number of functions in it that is useful on the iPad, uh, on an iPhone. It's not available on iPad yet. I can point my camera at a business card and it'll translate that into words so that I can know what is said on the business card. Okay, so it'll just quickly read a business card to me. To me, there is, there's a document channel. The document channel is if you can hold it over a page of paper and you take the picture of that, it'll OCR it and then it'll, you'll be able to read it. Uh, now we know all know that OCR um, is not perfect, so there may be errors in that. Product. There's a product channel. That product channel allows you to scan barcodes on a box of cereal or something, so you know what it is without having to stick your finger in and say, hmm, Cheerios. And that's all within that app. All that's within that app. Person. There's a person one here that I could take a picture one face, of a person. One face, one face, zero faces. Oh. One face, one face near two face, one face near left edge, one face near top left. Zero so faces, tell me the face is near the edge, then I can take a picture. Scene preview. Scene preview, I could go here. Take picture. Button. I'll take, take a picture. picture. Processing. A group of people sitting at a table in a room. Group of people sitting at a table in a room. Close. Button. I want people to know that these features are here and that it's an actual tool that you can use, especially as a, as, a, as a blind person or as somebody who's teaching blind people, that these sorts of tools are out there and it's, it's something you can look forward to because this, is, this sort of technology has been out for about eight years now, eight, nine years, and look how far it's come. So there's only going to be even better things in the future. Coming up on AMI Inside. So that got me really questioning, what is going on? Dr. Kevin Stewart provides some extraordinary insights into education and employment for the visually impaired. Stay with us. AMI Inside will return. This is AMI Inside. Welcome back to the Canadian Vision Teachers Conference 2018 from NISQ, Alberta. And how were people who were blind or low vision being oppressed to enter a field by able-bodied people? Dr. Kevin Stewart is an administrator of blind and low vision services for the York District School Board in Ontario. He's here to present Becoming an Ally, Equity and Inclusive Education for Students with Visual Impairments. It's all about the relationship we have with each other, with children, with the land, and with the environment. My journey, starting at the Nova Scotia Teachers College, wanting to become a teacher, and then wanting to become a teacher of students with visual impairments, and I knew that from a very young age, which is kind of a funny story in and of itself. Well, I guess that would go back to my grade six year, 
as a, a boy in Nova Scotia, and uh, I was watching a show called Little House on the Prairies. And what I particularly remember is when one of the lead characters, Mary Ingalls, went blind and had to go to the school for the blind in the neighboring city. At that point, I was glued to that uh, TV show. And coming from a line of teachers in my family, I knew I wanted to be a teacher, but there was just something that gravitated me towards blindness and kept that dream throughout my uh, high school years. So when I did my initial training, for the next 15 years of my career in the field of blind, low vision, and deafblind, I dedicated myself, as many of you, to going to conferences and workshops to actually learn what the slide says here. What is our professional role? Well, to improve our skills and determine the unique learning needs, so that's assessment, of our students, to facilitate their access to the academic, social, and physical environment with appropriate knowledge, skills, and attitudes. We also learned in education, especially in the last 10 years, the importance of well-being. That it's not just about student success, which in many provinces is measured by standardized testing or formal testing. But there's more to student success and there's more to learning and cherishing children than just academic success. There's this whole idea about well-being. Well, self-esteem, again, is a very, it's a huge issue when you talk about the well-being of individuals. And we know that when people have a positive self-esteem or positive well-being, meaning they feel like they belong, they feel welcomed, they're respected for who they are, and for all the parts of who they are, all their social identities, we know that if they, they have that and, and they're feeling good about themselves and they're welcomed, then success will come. Success comes after. It is the outcome of that because then you're more engaged in your environment. You're more engaged in your learning. The purpose of education is to take your rightful place in society and contribute to society and contribute to a global community. What happens post-secondary? Well, something we do know is that children who are blind or low vision now young adults will attend post-secondary institutions at a comparable rate with those who are cited. So academically, in school and, and in post-secondary, they're achieving, they're going on. The Canadian government reports that the majority, 82% of population aged 25 to 54, are employed of the Canadian population. 51% of people with disabilities are employed. That's a big difference. Now, if you look at the needs of blind low vision in Canada, 25% of adults aged 21 to 64 are employed. So of those people, only 25% are employed. And 48% of those adults learn less than 20,000 a year. They are not achieving or making incomes that others are making in comparable professions. And when I talked to the narrative of my students, guess what I found? They're all unemployed. So that got me really questioning what is going on. So how do we change that? We are professionals that earn a very good salary to do what we're doing, to work with people who are blind and visually impaired, of which many of us are not, yet they have a high rate of unemployment. Is that fair? Is that a just society? Is that equitable? Does that make us feel, yay, we've done a great job? We can provide skills. And we can provide and, and encourage you and uh, advocate. However, if we don't start teaching our students and other people uh, who, and even other people who are able-bodied, how to disrupt systems that are creating that in the first place, creating that marginalization, that disadvantage, then we're only perpetuating the same system that we want to try to stop, which is the low unemployment rate of our students. You are an ally when you disrupt structures and systems for people who are marginalized. To look at the system to say, why, is, why are these marginalizations, what's perpetuating this, and how do we stop it? So we have to look beyond what we do as individuals with individual students to find how does education really function? What's happening? An ally is how you act in solidarity with. So as an ally, you do not speak for 
people who are blind, low vision, or, or, or anyone who's marginalized. You do not speak over them. You must speak with them. You must bring their voice to the table when their voice is not there. So when I sit at board uh, meetings with superintendents, other principals, do you think I'm sitting with anyone with a visual impairment at that table? I said, how many people do we employ as teachers who actually have a disability? And then again, how many do we employ who are blind? And how many do we employ who are low vision? Guess how many we have? Zero. Yet we are the biggest employer in the York Region community. And we have 150 students who identify blind and low vision within that community. And I feel like I'm saying, we will educate you, but we won't hire you. That's the reality. So that's how I got into this anti-oppression work. How do I disrupt this? How do I bring the voice of those whose voice isn't at the table and get people to recognize their voice isn't at the table? First of all, you have to learn about your own identities. Who are you? How do you intersect with families and kids? Who are your identities? How does it play out? How do you walk this space? What privileges, unearned privileges, do you naturally get because you are sighted? Because you are male? Because you are heterosexual? Because you are Christian? What privileges afford you this? And there's many other parts of your identity. We are both oppressors and oppressed. So we both have areas where we have power, privilege, and we have areas where we don't. And you know what they are. Any space you navigate, if you navigate the space and you feel welcomed and free and you navigate it, that's your privilege. Ask a racialized person how they feel in that same space. Ask our students who are racialized and visually impaired how they feel, or their parents. So we have to understand identities first, but you have to understand your own. Because every time you have an interaction, your identities come into contact, and it plays out. You have to be aware of it, how it works. You have to know what does it mean to be an ally? How do I speak with, not for or above? And then how do I put that into action and do it daily? And I tell you, once you learn this stuff, you never go back. You never see the world in the same way. So what I want you to do at your table, is there note pages or pens? People will have devices, braille notes, computers, whatever you're using. I want you to take a pen, take a piece of paper. Now what's going to be really hard is, is, is this is a self-task. You can't talk because we're talking about you. And when we talk about you, it gets very personal, who your identities are. Now when you do equity work or anti-oppression work, you do not divulge anything you do not feel is in your well-being to or not divulge. But here's what I want you to do. Identity, social identities are this. Your religion, your sexual orientation, your gender identity, your biological sex, what, or what we'll call your assigned, sex, um, your family status, your education, things that identify you. Keep that list by you. You don't have to share that list. I'd never ask you to share that list. But just keep it with you. You may add to it. This whole idea about our identities and our students' identities. Who are your students? Not just blind, visually impaired, deaf blind, but who are they? What would their identities be? Look at your students beyond their visual impairment. That they are more than that. There is much more to them. Different cultures come with different beliefs. And what is your cultural belief? What is your bias? What are your assumptions? What are people's assumptions around a table? Part of an ally starts to disrupt that and say, I think that's a bias. Let's talk about this. Is that really what the family wants, what the student wants? If you don't address the needs of the family or the student, you have disengaged them. We must look internally first, understand who we are in order to understand our students and how we interact. 
what I am hoping is that it raises their critical awareness of uh, what are the systemic uh, barriers that are put up in our educational system and how are we a part of that, that we're not separate from that, that we are, as able-bodied people, a part of those systemic barriers. And how can we start to disrupt it? How can we start to act in solidarity with students that face those barriers on a day-to-day -day basis? AMI Inside, the Canadian Vision Teachers Conference, will be right back. AMI Inside will return. This is AMI Inside. Welcome back. Just dollar store items and a lot of trial and error. Zobeda Altagir is an educational assistant with the Edmonton Public School System. She's come to the conference to present adapted board games. Today you will see some board games, some adapted board games and some literacy centers that I created um, in the last three years working with a student who is blind visually impaired and he loves to play these games. They're all curriculum based, so I try to use it as for social skills, um, language, speech and language, math, reading, sentence making. I will start with my, the first one I created. Does everybody know the game Boggle? So it's little dice that have letters and then you have to shake them. They're in a container and you shake the container and then you get the letters that come on the top and you have to try to make your own words. Buttons, pipe cleaners, and magnets are just some of the materials used to adapt games like Boggle. For this game, she used a large piece of orange bristol board, which is a particular type of thick paper. Small, soft pom-poms are glued to index cards to form the braille letters, which then attach to the bristol board to create words. They sit on the floor and they're feeling the braille, even the ones who don't know braille, and they're, um, making their words with it. It helps build the word building. It helps the process of writing, interactive play. Usually about four players are, um, are playing this. Um, the students who, I have a little sheet for our sighted students where they can fill in the letters and um, make their sentences. And for my braille using student, he uses his brailler and brailles the sentence, the letters. Then what we do is to take it a little bit further, we, um, I have them make sentences with the words that they create. So now let's put your words in sentences. This cost me about between five and $10 to make, but it is a little bit of time consuming. My next one is headbands. Who's ever played headbands? It's great for developing um, language skill, oral language skills, communication. It has vocabulary cards and you have to wear a headband and you can't see the card and you have, you have to ask questions about what is on the card. Am I a vegetable? Can you eat me? Can I fly? Do I have wings? Am I alive? Like those kind of questions. So there are little cards for regular students, sighted students to read. I have a brailled version which I've added more um, questions to it to help with the language skills. So what I've done is I've created, just with some things around the school, around the house, my own version with braille on it using a tactile, a real life thing. Because our blind and visually impaired students need, they need to have something real life. And I have elastic band, a block, candy, marble. So I'm always adding to what I have. No. And I try to use a lot of real life things that I can find in a smaller version. So also a hook. One of the cutest ones is the little truck. So at least this way he can go to a friend and feel it and know, oh yeah, and read it. Yep, that's a truck. Okay. And then walk back. Some challenges that popped up trying to adapt these games were like, how is this going to work for him? Is he going to be able to read? Is the braille tactile enough? Am I using the right materials? Is this big enough? Is it, is it too big? How is it going to be, you know, is he going to be able to play with other students? 
So I experiment and try and, you know, I try to have like a prototype and, okay, we'll try this first and let's see if it works and I'll have some students come and they play together. Nope, it's not working. Have to modify it a little bit more. So it's a lot of trial and error and it takes some time to create. My next game is just a generic board game that I pulled off of the internet and I've made it tactile. So I've used uh, pipe cleaners and also puff paint, fabric paint. So it's tactile and you can feel it. And this, I use this with everything. So for math, for spelling, for conversation, just oral testing also, I use it for everything. So what we can do, one of the examples is I would, um, for example, math, I would give him some dice, okay, or him and a friend will play. Let's roll the dice. We're working on subtraction. Okay, roll the dice. Oh, what do you have? Six minus three. What's your answer? Is it correct? Yep. Grab a card from the little envelope, and it's all in braille and in print, and it says move forward seven. So the game never finishes because it's always move forward and move back, depend on what you get. So most of the times it's, you know, the time is up and they're still playing. They're not done yet. There's no winner. And I just use different ta uh, manipulatives. So like a snowflake, a block with a bead on it, whatever I can find, and they love it. The only way the kids can learn is by having fun, by being engaged and happy, because they don't know they're learning, they think they're playing, but they're learning at the same time, and you can see it on their faces, and you can see how excited they are to come and play that game. Stay with us as Julie and Lowell Taylor from The Amazing Race Canada turn obstacles into opportunities. We have learned many things through obstacles, and it's the obstacles that have led us to learn and grow. Stay with us. AMI Inside will return. This is AMI Inside. Welcome back to AMI Inside and the 2018 Canadian Vision Teachers Conference. Lowell and Julie Taylor appeared on Season 4 of The Amazing Race Canada, finishing 7 of 11 stages, with Lowell being the first visually impaired contestant in franchise history. Julie and Lowell, married couple from Lethbridge, Alberta. A team in The Amazing Race and a team in life. Lowell and Julie Taylor present their story about what it takes to get through life's challenges and turn obstacles into opportunities. Good evening, CVTC. In life, there will be obstacles. With school, work, home, physical and mental health, and only you can choose your attitude, and only you are in control of your response. To set the scene for the following clip, we are in Vietnam. It is super hot, like plus 50 degrees Celsius hot. We haven't eaten, we hadn't slept. We had been lost for three hours and nobody spoke English. This was our final dash to the pit stop. Feel free to laugh if you desire. Oh, let's go, Lowell. With Lowell holding on to a strap attached to Julie's backpack, she moves quickly around a tree, but Lowell runs right into it. Sorry about that, Lowell. I completely ran you into that tree. That's perfectly okay, because I feel that scene had tremendous impact. <laughs> oh, Lowell, it was so cheesy, but it was a big hit. And it... <laughs> yeah. uh, okay, another point. <laughs> It seems to have had impact. I'm not one of those guys who likes to beat around the bush, as you saw in the video clip. I like to run right into it. What's the point? I'm blind, and that's a pretty big obstacle. And though I wouldn't choose to be blind, I'm very thankful for what it's taught me and the opportunities that it's given us. I was the first blind racer on any Amazing Race franchise, and we were very honored to have that role. But we're gonna talk more about the Amazing Race in a little bit first, Let's talk about life before The Amazing Race. I have retinitis pigmentosa. Many of you are familiar, but it's a degenerative eye condition where I slowly lose my vision. I've been losing it ever since I was a little boy, and I currently have no peripheral vision. I have 15 degrees. I have compromised central vision and low acuity, and I have no vision in low light and compromised color vision. So I live every day in a sighted world without the vision to go along. And it makes things difficult on a day-to-day -day basis. So while these eyes may look good, they don't look so good. 
I want to introduce you to little Lowell. <laughs> kind of cute. But behind those big glasses are some very sad eyes. He was a very sad boy. I was going blind ever since birth, but it started with the vision at night. I got glasses at grade one. They were big, and they, they led to bullying and, and people teasing me. But it wasn't just the vision. There are also some other things going on. So when I was on a bright July summer's day, 1984, little Lowell was standing on the hood of a 1979 Colony Park Mercury station wagon with fake wood paneling. <laughs> Alongside his siblings, his older brother, five years older, who also has RP, two older sisters and a younger sister. And we are on the roof on the side of a country road north of Calgary, cheering our mother as she was bringing the cows home for evening milking. <laughs> she jumped in the vehicle. The children jumped off the side, climbed in the vehicle. Mom started to move forward. Unfortunately, little Lowell wasn't brave enough to go down the side and jump into the ditch. He climbed down the front. The car moving forward knocked little Lowell over, and the car, the front right wheel, went right over his stomach. Now, I didn't die. That would have dramatically changed the story. <laughs> it did lead to pinched nerves in my bowels, which led to compromised bowel control, which led to some pretty crappy moments through my childhood. <laughs> so I was the stinky, blind, fat, lonely kid. I felt broken. I take out a hammer and I smash the bowl. It's a representation of how I felt, broken in pieces, worthless, no purpose, no sense for the future. Life started to get a little bit better. I went off to university. And to pay for it, I had to go back to the family farm. And one summer day, I was working on a silage bagger, a machine that packs silage feed, cow feed, into a big bag. And I was standing on the machine cleaning it, and it was turned on accidentally. And six inch spikes started to rip through my legs and pull me into the machine. It was turned off quickly. I was shot out, blood everywhere. Dad put a tourniquet on my leg and, and rushed me to the hospital. They put the ear monitor on, and I hear beep, beep, beep. I asked the doctor if I was dead. He assured me I was not. A malfunction of the machine, but that would have changed the story also. <laughs> At age 24, I went to my ophthalmologist, and he had the difficult job of informing me that he would have to write a letter to Alberta Transportation to remove my license. So I started to fall down into another depression. Around that time, I call this my quarter life crisis, things kept crumbling around me. And life continues to be hard. I speak about it as perpetual loss, perpetual grief, as I continually lose my vision. To his credit, Lowell's vision loss has never hindered him from challenging himself. He became a successful psychologist and, with Julie by his side, continues to turn obstacles into opportunities. Our advantage going in was our communication and teamwork, and we knew we'd have to rely heavily on that. Lowell would often have his hand on my backpack or he would hold this actual dog leash I had attached to my backpack. She kept me on a tight leash. Yeah, I did. <laughs> or we'd hold hands and I'd communicate with a simple hand squeeze or a single word, like up, left, or right. If I say jump, this guy jumps. See? Good boy. <laughs> the roadblocks were really tricky. Roadblocks are a task that only one person can complete with absolutely no help from your partner. And the clues are super vague, so you really don't know what you're getting yourself into. This was very difficult for us, because if Lowell picked anything that was too visual, then boom, we could be eliminated. So part of our strategy here was that if the clue at all indicated heights or strength, then Lowell would take it. So in Jasper, the clue read, who wants to let it all hang out? I do. Lowell likes that. <laughs> we thought it was bungee jumping from the Jasper Sky Tram. Turned out it, a bungee fall meant a failed attempt at the actual challenge, which was completing those monkey bars below the sky tram. Lowell's fine in the strength department, even with the extra 30-pound bungee cord hanging from him. 
but it was his sight that got in the way. The rungs were black with a black background, and so he couldn't see them. So he very slowly felt his way to the last rung, and when he reached for that last rung, oh, he on. slipped Ooh. and fell. My disappointment quickly turned into excitement. <laughs> now, I'm bungee jumping from the Sky Tram in Jasper. <laughs> Something you can't even pay to do. I, ch <laughs> I chose to live in the moment, to be present despite the disappointment. We have learned many things through obstacles. And it's the obstacles that have led us to learn and grow. I also learned that my brokenness is beautiful. I once saw myself as shattered. I saw my brokenness as weakness, that I didn't belong, that I didn't have worth or value, that I couldn't see that future of hope and value. I speak about moments where I felt broken, but also the moments that felt repairing. And understanding the word kintsugi, the idea of golden repair, the bowl is put back together with gold. So each line represents healing. And after the bowl is put back together, it has more character and more beauty, and it has more worth than it did before. This healing is a way to see that we're all beautiful. And when we share that with each other, we don't have to see ourselves as weak or broken, but we can see ourselves as beautiful and have something to offer other people. Thank you, everybody. Go live with heart. Thank you, guys. Thank you. AMI Inside, the Canadian Vision Teachers Conference, will be right back. AMI Inside will return. This is AMI Inside. After four days, dozens of concurrent sessions, keynote speakers, and tours through Exhibitors Hall, Seeing Beyond the Horizon 2018 comes to a close. AMI Inside asked a number of attendees to share their thoughts on this year's conference. My name is Marin Barrows, and I am a teacher of the visually impaired here in Alberta. I've been in this field for about 30 years because my brother is blind, so I've enjoyed connecting with uh, longtime friends, old friends from all across Canada. Most of my outcomes are probably going to be around technology. It is one of those areas that is changing so fast that when we get an opportunity to meet with specialists and vendors, those are the people that I'm, I'm really eager to talk to so that I can bring that information back to my, my students and their families. Retired vision teacher Diana Brent. These kind of conferences are essential. I think that as a retired teacher, my job is to support new teachers, those coming up. And I think that the new teachers coming up are the ones that are going to make our profession grow and stimulate us all. I'm Lynn Langell, and I'm a vision teacher in Kelowna, BC. I think we all leave here a little bit powered up. It's like refresh and go back and take what we've learned. And I, I think for me, um, the, the discussion about e equity and oppression, talking about making things more equitable for our students in the classroom, and what are the next steps to address those issues. Thanks to the dedication of education professionals like these, blind and low vision students across Canada can look beyond the horizon toward a shared vision of hope and inspiration. For everyone at AMI Inside, thanks for watching. Producers, Tim Tester, Linda Blackwell. Narrator, Melissa Keith. Videographer, Tim Tester. Editors, Tim Tester, Manuel Grados Andrade, Maryam Bakhtiar, Integrated Described Video Specialist, Simone Cupid, Production Supervisor, Janice Civitilli, Director Production, Kara Nye, Director Programming, Brian Perdue, Vice President Programming and Production, John Melville, President and CEO, David Arrington, Copyright 2018, Accessible Media Incorporated.